Well, I was just uh, mentioning to Richard how I love uh, the time that we can spend together and we can fellowship together. I think, again, a lot of times as we think of coming together and having this elongated time, I think for a lot of people they get tired and everything, but I think it's really good for us, you know, to persevere, to, to really talk, uh, to really have, you know, godly conversations or so, sometimes even light conversations just to get to know one another. Uh, that, that later on we can have these heavy conversations, these, these more, what I would just say, deep conversations. And I'm so thankful uh, that we're able to do that and we're able to have that fellowship that happens to be again in Christ. And so thankful to see so many who have uh, stayed and persevered. You know, uh, it's such an encouragement uh, to, uh, to see so many who want to hear the word of God, who want to worship with God's people. Uh, today, we, we've been going through the Gospel of John and, uh, and we come to the end of chapter number 10 and we realized as we looked at this passage last time we were together that the Jews led a mob, in other words the citizens of Jerusalem, in order to stone the Lord Jesus. And the reason why they wanted to stone the Lord Jesus is they accused him of blasphemy, making himself equal with God. And Jesus again has a mastery of the scriptures and he shows again in the word of God how others were called gods or how others were even called the sons of gods through the words of God. They were representatives of this God. They were ruling over the people in a God-like fashion as God's representative. And he says, how much more the one who is equal to God, the one who is at one with God. And that's one of the things I love about the Gospel of John is you have these very tense moments, these very, again, um, uh, moments where there's so much um, intensity that happens to be right there, but you never have Jesus Christ change the message. You know, he never alters the message. He doesn't, again, downplay the message. If you've ever, ever been in the presence of somebody who's angry, many times you try to appease, many times you try to bring it down. He doesn't. You know, but he does something else absolutely startling, and you've seen this all the way through uh, the Gospel of John in these ten situations. And he says in verses 37 and 38, he says, If I am not doing the works of my Father, do then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. He claims his deity once again, but he says, look at my works. Look at what you know about the Messiah in the Old Testament and compare them and believe on me. I mean, think about it. These are individuals that want to terminate his life. And how does he respond? He responds by giving them the grace. He responds by saying, look at who I am. Believe in me for eternal life. And it's absolutely stunning. And then we read in verse number 39, which basically ends um, uh, this section. He says, and again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. And the idea, again, that happened to be their escape is basically this. They're no longer trying to stone him. Maybe after everything that Jesus has said in this chapter, the citizens of Jerusalem were a little less um, uh, uh, anxious or a little less, again, uh, wanting to stone him. So they thought they would arrest him. And maybe bring him before the Sanhedrin and at least go through a mock trial and then have his life terminated. But we realize that Jesus went out from them. He escaped out of their midst. And the reason why is because his time has not come. You know, in a few short months, his time will come where he gives his life as a perfect ransom for sin. But it's not right here. You know, and it's incredible because with this, he leaves Jerusalem. And uh, the, the Gospel of John is a little unique here because it gives us a lot of information about his ministry that happened to be in Jerusalem. And this time in Jerusalem started way back in chapter number 7. You remember in chapter number 7, he comes to Jerusalem uh, to, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And in the midst of that Feast of Tabernacles, he announces that I am the light of the world. And we have all of this dialogue, all of this back and forth with the citizens of Jerusalem and also, again, the religious leaders. But when you look at those chapters, even though Jesus is the greatest light and the most brightest light that has ever shone on this planet, there's so much darkness. There's so much rejection of Jesus Christ. You have that rejection over and over. It doesn't matter what he says. It doesn't matter what miracle he performs. There's, there's rejection after rejection after rejection of the citizens of Jerusalem and also the religious leaders. And at the beginning of the gospel, we are told this is the way it's going to be. You know, in John chapter 1, uh, one in verses 10 and 11, it says he was in the world and the world was made through him. And then it says this, yet the world did not know him. And look at what it says next. He came to his own, in other words, his own 
people. And his own people did not receive him. You know, and after all the opposition that happens to be in Jerusalem, you can see it. You can see some of these tense uh, arguments and these tense dialogue that happens to be going on. He leaves Jerusalem. And when he comes back to Jerusalem, he's going to come back just the outskirts of, of uh, Jerusalem to Bethany. And you're going to have the resurrection of Lazarus at that time. And then a little while after that, you're going to have Jesus enter Jerusalem for the final time, what we call the Passion Week, where he'll give his life as a perfect ransom for sin. And we will see the ultimate resurrection of Jesus Christ. But these chapters tell us beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's going to be opposition in Christianity. You know, there's going to be opposition to the message. And there's going to be far more people who reject the message of Jesus Christ rather than trust in, in that message. You know, and if you've ever been active in ministry, you realize this beyond a shadow of a doubt. That ministry is difficult. Ministry is hard. You know, there's going to be things that are said about you just because of your loyalty to Jesus Christ. Just because you preach the message or make him known. You know, they're, they're, uh, many times people are going to malign you. Many times you're going to have your heart just wrenched out that happens to be in you because you pour your life into individuals uh, and they'll turn around and they'll walk away from the Lord Jesus Christ and even mock the Christ that you love and even scorn and ridicule, you know, your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and this happens so often that I think a lot of times we come to a place in our lives and we say this, what's the use why should I go on? Why should I serve him? Why should I keep studying? Why should I keep laboring? You know, Paul even talked about this in preaching. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verses 3 and 4, he says, For the time will come when people will not endure. Think about the sound teaching. In other words, the proclamation of the truth of God. He says, they will not endure sound teaching, but have each itching ears, will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And it's incredible. You can see that before our eyes today. You know, the largest churches that happen to be in Canada, the largest churches that happen to be in the U.S., the largest churches that happen to be in Africa, the largest churches that happen to be in Korea, and we could go on and on and on and on, are those, again, who... Who, who have itchy ears. You know, they teach myths that do not teach the truth. And you look at the, some of these churches and you look at some of the faithful pastors that happen to be again in these small churches and they'll preach and preach and preach and preach and labor and labor and labor and labor. And here's the thing, it seems so fruitless. It seems like nothing is going on. You know, and I think a lot of times if you poured your heart into ministry, you felt some of that frustration with the lack of fruitfulness that happens to be seen on the outside. That you ask the question, why should I go on? Why should I keep doing it? Why should I keep laboring? And let me just give you two quick answers. The one answer is this. It's because ultimately we, we, we care about people. That's, that's absolutely true. We want to see people converted. We want to see people living for the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the thing you have to realize. Ultimately, we play for an audience of one. It's for our great God that happens to be above. It's faithfulness to him. I mean, Jesus says in the midst of opposition, he says it over and over, I have come to do the will, not of the people, the will of my Father that happens to be in heaven. And even in the midst of all of this, all of this rejection, all of this scorn, all of this ridicule, all of this hatred, I mean, a number of times through those last three chapters, they've wanted to pelt Jesus with, with stones. They wanted to end his life. And he kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And one of the things we have to realize, you know, what's the use? Why should I do this? And this is why, is because we're called to faithfulness. We're called to serve this audience of one. But the second reason why we should do this and why we should, uh, is to realize that our ministry efforts, even when things look bleak, when things look unproductive, when things look unfruitful, such is not the case. You know, if we would see everything that is done in a typical Bible-believing church on a given Sunday and all the good that was done, it would blow our minds away. You know, it's incredible, you know, when we even look at our own lives, how we've come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's incredible, again, how that when the ministry goes out, you know, we see the saints build up. We see them instructed. We see wayward sheep all of a sudden being brought back into the fold. 
And let me just say this, there's far more that's going on in a given Sunday in a Bible-believing church that we'll ever see, that we'll ever realize. You know, and I know it's a, a Sunday afternoon, it's beautiful outside and all of that other stuff, but I really want to encourage your hearts this morning. I really want to encourage your heart with this message. I want you to persevere. I want you to realize that your efforts in the Lord as you serve him really do matter and matter for all of eternity. And so what I want us to do, because it's really important that we see this in Scripture, right? I can tell you, your, your, your effort matters, your effort uh, matters. And I almost, I almost feel like the, uh, the parent, you know, and, and, and here the daughter has just been rejected by her, her uh, boyfriend, and I'm putting her, you know, I'm, I'm the father, and I'm putting, oh, well, dad loves you. You know, it, it only goes so far, right? It only goes so far. So I want you to see it, not from, well, pastor says that God loves, or, 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 but I want you to see it in the scripture. I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's more going on, you know, that we might praise, that we might glorify this great God that happens to be again in heaven. So what I want us to do is walk through the passage, get a gr really clear understanding of the passage. I hope you'll stay with me. And then we're going to draw some conclusions you know, after we get this right understanding. And I hope it'll be a great encouragement. I hope it'll cause you, if you're discouraged today, if you're discouraged today, if you're discouraged today, say, you know, why should I keep going? I hope you'll find so much encouragement in this passage of Scripture. So let's walk through the passage. We're going to be looking at verses 40 and following. And look at what it says. It says, again, speaking of Jesus, it says, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained, and many came to him, and they said, John did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true. And then we have verse number 42, and many believed in him there. You know, and I find this so amazing. In, if you've been involved in ministry for decades, let's say, you know the truth. You know the truth of this. It's just outstanding that many times the grace of God strikes in places that you would never think it would strike. You know, there happens to be individuals that happen to be over there that show some interest, and you think beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're going to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but it never comes. But in, over in this individual, that happens to be again over here. I can remember when I first got saved, there happened to be an individual named Arthur. And Arthur used to scorn and ridicule and tease me about Christianity all the time. And I used to smile and I used to laugh as long as the jokes were kind of clean. You know, and I shouldn't say kind of clean, when they were clean. You know, and, and, and I tried to befriend him. I can remember one time, you know, he invited me and we went fishing and, and, and all of that. And, and Arthur finally came to, to, uh, to a church. Arthur finally made a profession of faith. Arthur finally had his life cleaned up. You know, and out of all the people that I worked with at that time, I would never have thought that Arthur would be the one whom the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would touch. You know, but that's the way it is with grace, right? We're called to be faithful. We're called to di discharge the duty that God has given us. We're called to give the message. We're called to take that, that, that seed, right? And we don't know what the soil's like. We're called just scatter it, just broadcast it wide. And we leave the results to this great God. You know, and as we look at verse number 40 again, it says, speaking of Jesus again, he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there remained. And, and this is a huge turning point. This really is brought up in the synoptic gospels. You can see it a lot clearer, more clear. But this ends his public ministry. You know, all the things of going where people are going, where people are, is not right here. He retires. He realizes he only has a few months left, and he's going to pour it into the disciples at this time. So he goes to the place where John was baptizing. Now think about it, because you guys know the word of God. Where was John baptizing? And I can give you it in one word. Desert. Right? I can give you it in another word. Desolate. Right? There's no major um, uh, cities, there's no major towns, there's no major trade routes that happen to be again right here. He goes to this place, and it's not because he's scared of the religious leaders, but he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that his time is coming to an end. You know, and he realizes with these 12 individuals, and one is going to betray him, with these individuals that happen to be right here, this, this, unpromising as they may be, these are the individuals that God is going to use to establish the church of Jesus Christ. And so he pours his heart, he pours his life into them during this time. 
But I think at the same time, these last few months must have been a uh, joyous time for Jesus. Because right here in this Judean desert, in this Judean area, is where Jesus began his ministry. It was in this uh, um, uh, area that, that he called the disciples, and they came to him and began to follow him. And, him, and they've almost been with him for the, the uh, last three years. But he goes on from there, and he tells us something so significant. And listen, listen to the next verse. I think this is such an encouraging verse. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign. But everything that John said uh, about this man was true. You know, and this, this verse, again, I think is so encouraging just because of the simplicity of it and the simplicity of John's ministry. Because we see that people, right, 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 here it is. If you want to do ministry, what do you do? You go to people, you go to people, you go to people. Here's Jesus. He's in a desolate place, and what's happening? People are coming to him. People are coming to him. People are coming to him. But here's the question. Why are people coming to Jesus? Why are they coming to hear him? Why are they coming to be in his presence? And that's what I find so amazing. The reason why they're coming into his presence is because of the ministry of John. Now, if I said John the Baptist, you know, describe John the Baptist's ministry, and you did not read the text, and you just thought like that, I think you would think sensational. You know, otherworldly. Kaboom! You know, fireworks, miracles, signs, wonders. And it says right here in this text that John did no signs. You know, it wasn't the miraculous. It wasn't, again, all of these signs, but he had a straightforward message, right? He was a simple Galilean preacher with a simple message. It wasn't complicated. Each sermon had two points. And you know what they were? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And why is the kingdom of heaven at his hand? Because the king is ready to come on the world stage. Prepare your hearts for his coming. And he would preach about Jesus Christ. You know... And, and it created such a stir that happened beginning to people. And the reason why is because of what he taught about Jesus. Remember the religious leaders? Religious leaders came to, came to him and said, said, are you some sort of esch eschatological figure that we should be looking at? He says, no. You know, that's not my message. And his message was basically this in John chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. He says, uh, he says John answered, I baptize with water, but among you stands one, you do not know, even who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Here's John, the most holy man of all Israel, uh, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, you look at me, you look at the throngs coming to me, you look at the message that I preach, and I'm preaching Christ, and I want you to see his worth. Even the lowest service I could render to him, I'm not worthy of it. That's how great this one is. That's how fantastic he is. And think of it. He's preaching this message. He's preaching this message. Repent, repent. The king is coming. The king. This is who the king is. Look at his grandeur. Look at who he is. You know, and, and one time he's preaching, and his disciples happen to be, again, all around him, and Jesus comes before him. And you know what he says? He says these words in, in uh, 129. He says, Behold the Lamb of of God who takes away the sins of the world. Right? This is the one. This is the sacrifice. This is the one you, you need. So think about it. Right? right? Here John. John's put in prison. John's executed. You know, and he's gone. Right? No more. And then we read, right here in this verse, you know, this testimony of the ministry of John. Everything John said about this man is true. Now think about it. When they came into Jesus' presence, the stunning beauty of God in human flesh, the stunning beauty, again, of his perfect righteousness, you know, they recognized. And why did they recognize, right? Uh, here's this one. Here's this august one who John said, I cannot even loosen his sand. And we recognize him. You know, we realize that we're sinners. We realize that we need an atonement. We realize, again, we need all these things that happen to begin in our life. And here it is. Here is the Lamb of God. And think about it. Because they say, the reason why we recognize him. Here's Jesus, and he's in the Galilean wilderness. Here he is in the Judean wilderness. People are coming out. They hear the preaching of Jesus. They hear about Jesus. They hear about who he is. And guess what? We know him. 
And why? Because of that guy who announced him and preached on him. And it says right at the end of the chapter, after all the rejection that we have read over and over and over and over again, that it ends on such a high note. It ends this way. And many believed in him there. <laughs> what irony. Really. You know, it's incredible because think about it. If you're starting off the gospel and you're saying, here, here comes God in human flesh. Here, here he's going to be born of a virgin. Here he's going to become the savior of the world. And you're going to, and you're going to be a betting person. You're going to say, where are people going to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord, God in human flesh? Where are they going to recognize his superiority over everyone and everything? What would you say? My bet, although I don't bet, my bet would be in Jerusalem. Wouldn't it be you? I mean, they're religious. They're deep down in the Old Testament knowledge. I would not think in the Judean wilderness, where here there's an intermingling with Gentiles. There's, again, sin that happens to be, again, so rampant that it happened to be, again, over here. And it's right here. Not just a few, but many believe on him. And here's the amazing thing. God works in so many stunning ways many times that we just, you know, his grace works in places that we would never expect it to work. You know, we're to give the message or to leave those results to him. But I want to draw some conclusions that happen to be again of this. And one of the conclusions that I want us to draw of this whole uh, uh, final paragraph in verse number 10 is basically this. That one, one is that our ministries uh, many times as far as the fruitfulness, as far as looking at the external fruit that happens to be there, can seem so limited, can seem, again, so fruitless or non-existent in the life. And we realize that God has called us to faithfulness, but he's also called us to fruitfulness, hasn't he? But here's the thing that we have to realize, is many times what we see is not reality. It really isn't. You know, and rem rem remember Jesus' parable of four soils? Remember? Three, three weren't so good, were they? But one was great. You know, and we read about that soil in Mark chapter 4 and verse number 20 because it says, but those who were sown, sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word of God and accept it. And what do they do? Bear fruit. 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. I don't know how many sermons I've heard about, it, about this. What kind of Christian are you? Are you 30-fold or 100-fold? Right? 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 Isn't it true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You've heard one like that too, too, too. And I heard Michael I laugh over here too. Thirtyfold or a hundredfold. In other words, some people are not so productive, and other people again are real productive. Let me tell you. You know, um, usually a farmer, you know, when he plants, if he has a real good crop, he has um, seven crops uh, for the seed that happens to be go, 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 going out. So there's a sevenfold. Uh, better crop that comes out of that. You know, one seed goes in the ground, it brings up, and it, you, you have sevenfold that happens to be on there. That's a real good crop. But right here he's saying something outstanding. He said, for, the, for those who are truly born-again Christian who believe on me, they shall be so fruitful that some of them are going to be 30. And if that was enough, it would be like, ah. Some of them are going to be 60. Ah. Some of them are going to be 100. Ah. Right? And when we look at that, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you have to realize this. This is a fruit that's going on in our heart, but also going out, on, uh, out here. But here's the thing. Many times we do not see or cannot comprehend and will never see this side of eternity, all that's going on. And I realize we want to magnify Christ. We want to glorify Christ. We want to make much of him. And we want to see, because we want Christ to be praised, we want to see this external fruitfulness that happens to be going on here. But here's the thing that we have to be cautious of. The thing that we have to be cautious of is just because I do not see fruit, that there is no fruit. Right? We have to be very cautious. Think about it. Here's John the Baptist most popular preacher of his day. Throngs, multitudes are coming over to see him. He loses his head. Where do the throngs go? They're gone. Nobody's worshiping. Nobody's looking for the Christ. Right? And it looks like all is lost. Yeah, there was a burst of enthusiasm, but then it was gone. You know, it was really gone. And you can imagine John in prison. 
you know, realizing that his followers all of a sudden are so meager compared to what it was before. And it will be so easy to be in prison at that time and say, what was the use of that all? What was the purpose of all that? And not realize the great purpose. And you have to realize that our ministries are different, right? Some people water, some people plow, some people till, and some people harvest. We have this with the ministry of Paul and Apollos. He talks about it. He says, I, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave, gave the increase. You know, there's some that most of their lives preach faithfully and faithfully and faithfully and faithfully and faithfully and faithfully, and it seems like nothing's being done. But there's more that's being done beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I just want to give you one small illustration. You know, in my own life of the truthfulness again of this, and this is just a small illustration. When I was here two years... You know, somebody phoned me on the phone and asked me if they could come over and see me in my office. You know, and th this person happened to be, again, an unbeliever. You know, he happened to be, again, very, I would say, tough. You know, very hardened. And he comes into my office, and he sits down, and he looks really anxious, and he looks into my eye eyes, and gu guess what he said? I hardly knew this gentleman. And he said this, Pastor, I want to be saved. You know, and... Uh, I said, okay, let's get cracking, you know, and, and we went through the gospel. I wanted to make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt he understood the gospel, and that day we prayed in my office, and I can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that gentleman has followed on and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. They got baptized. They love the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're following and serving the Lord Jesus Christ today. Now, think about it. I harvested this, that day. I had never witnessed to that guy before. I had very little history in his life. And yet there was faithful people at Emmanuel Baptist Church that kept testifying, kept praying for him. You know, you know, that would come, and even when he would say something crude, would love him, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Right? But guess what I did that day? I harvested. But people tilled. People plowed. People prayed. People did the hard work, and I'm sure at times they looked at the hardness of this individual and they, say, they said to themselves, why bother? And here's the thing, there was more going on than they could ever imagine. And we don't know what God's doing. You know, our trust is in him. And this is where I say be really cautious because you're going to be preaching, you're going to be loving, you're going to be, again, trying to minister to others, and it seems like nobody cares. It seems like nothing's happening. But let me say beyond a shadow of a doubt, there is more happening than you could ever realize. It should encourage your heart beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know, another conclusion that we can make in this passage of of uh, scripture is a faithful preaching of John even when it didn't elicit the attended results was still being used you know he would preach and preach Christ and preach Christ and preach Christ and preach Christ and be faithful to the mission that God had given him and here's the amazing thing when people finally came to Christ when Christ finally arrived on the scene when he was before them when they heard him preach when they heard about his reputation they recognized him and why because of the faithful preaching of this man I don't think that there is a more faithful a more faithful compliment that you can pay to a preacher or teacher when they preach and when they teach and they come afterwards and say I see that God. I see that Jesus. I see who he is in that passage of scripture that you preached. Because what did you do? You preached to heaven to be there. And think of how different that is today. When you look at a conservative church, it's taken up with so many social issues today, isn't it? You know, we become... Yeah, 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 yeah. I realize Jesus. I realize his preeminence. I realize his superiority. But let's talk about this social issue. Let's talk about this political movement. Let's talk about these social ills that happen to be in society. I'm not saying that there's not a place for that. You know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a Christian response. But here's what happens so often, is that these things take priority over this, that all of a sudden... We miss the very Christ that happens to be in the scripture, in the gospels, in the epistles. You know, his superiority, his need that happened to be in our life. You know, and I think a lot of times even, when we look at this, there's so many churches that I think if they opened up the word of God 
and started reading the gospel, started reading the gospel, started reading the gospels, they would say this, this isn't the Jesus that we're here about. You know, uh, Jesus is my, about my health. He's about being wealthy. He's about being problem free. He's about, again, not, in this world you have many, what, what was it? All who desire to live godly will do what? You know, no, 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 no. They, they can't recognize him. You know, Jesus is a Jesus who would never condemn anyone. And when they open up the Gospels, why is Jesus always talking about wrath? Why is he always talking about judgment? Why is he talking about eternal punishment? I don't recognize him. You know, this is the Jesus again who, who, who loves you just the way you are. Well, why is it such a big deal about holiness? You know, Mike even talked, to, talked about that this, this, this morning. Well, why, why is it such a big deal? You know, and, and here's my whole point. I wonder in all of our interactions, because all of us have relationships inside the church and outside of the church, and I wonder in all of our interactions with people, with our children, with our friends, with our extended family members, with our neighbors, is as they have interaction with us, if they would ever open the word of God, they say, yeah, I recognize him, because so-and-so lives this way, because so-and-so spoke of this attribute of Christ, because so-and-so told me that this is why Jesus came. I recognize him. I wonder if anybody would recognize Jesus because of the Jesus we live for and the Jesus, again, that we speak of and preach. You know, that happens to be in our life. And let me just give one other conclusion that we can draw from this passage. And I think, again, it's so amazing, and I think it should be so encouraging. And it's basically this, that when you look at the ministry of John the Baptist, it's not around the sensational. Right? It isn't. You know, because we think in order to really do the work of God, you know, we got to get the church, we got to get people, we got to be sensational, right? So what we're going to do is just visualize everything. You know, this is why I love many times that our church many times is, is very professional and what it does, but it's not professionalized, right? Right, in a lot of churches, you don't have any lag time. You, you know, this morning for the final hymn, Ask Tim to come, come up, you know, and Tim walks up, and he gets up here, and he leads us in a hymn to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. In churches that are very visual, you don't have anybody walking up. By the time the pastor ends his preaching, now we're sight, and the, and the song leader's right there, and he's very emotional, he's very elaborate. You know, you have the swinging choir with their beautiful smiles and their, and their uh, th thing. And let me just say this, Richard, about that song in a month. In those type of churches, you don't sing laments. You don't sing about agony, about strife, about all these other things that happen to be, be, be there. It's all happy. You know, and, and, and there's also, again, a good-looking preacher. You know, and, and I'm sorry about this, guys. I'm really, really sorry about this. But you have a really good-looking pre preacher. And why? Because it's all about a sight. It's all about being sensational. Even if, we, if we're not doing miracles. It's all about what people see. And if I can leave people seeing and having a sense of awe, then we have them in the door. You know, we can have bigger budgets. We can have more people. You know, we can be fruitful, as we say many, many times. And when you look at John the Baptist's ministry, it's not around the sensational. Let me just say this. What I described, and I hope you know this, is not Christianity. It's not Christianity because Christianity and conversion, please get this, is never through the eyes. It's never through the eyes. It's never what I see. And we, well, they, they didn't have that back then. Yes, they did. They had Greek tragedies, which were very popular. And the Word of God says, never put on a Greek. It doesn't, it doesn't say this. Preach the gospel by putting on a Greek, a Greek tragedy. P putting on a play. Never says that. You know, how does faith come? And we know this, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes how? From hearing. And what do we hear? The word of Christ. That's how it comes. You know, and you look at John, you look at him in his camels there, you look at him eating locusts, you know, and there's nothing there to see visual that's outstanding. 
But when you look at him, he had a message. And what was the message? The word of Christ. When you look at the Apostle Paul, and when you, and let me just say this. This is why Protestant churches aren't ornate or shouldn't be ornate. You know, we shouldn't have gold up here. You know, we shouldn't have, again, all this fancy stuff that happens to be, again, right here, these big statuettes that happen to be. They're plain. And why? Because Protestant churches historically have understood this. The power is not in what people see. The power is in the message. You know, and the Apostle Paul even said this. In Romans chapter 1, in verse number 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Right? The gospel is something that is articulated. And why? Before it's this power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first. And also to the Greek. The power is in the life saving message of Jesus crucified, yea, risen from the grave. So let me try and tie this in a bow. You know, that happens to be again right here. Ministry. If you're involved in ministry, I can guarantee you beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's been moments in your life that you've been absolutely discouraged. There's been moments in your life where you see people, you know, even though you love them, even though you try to do your best, even though you want God to be glorified, you can see it, you can see it, you can see it, and it looks so meager. It looks like there's nothing being produced. It looks like there's nothing being affected. And it's so easy to think beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, uh, um, Tim read this. God's word never comes back Void, but produces exactly what God wants it to produce. And we might never see the results. You know, let me just end with this quick story. And it's about Charles Spurgeon, the greatest Baptist preacher, the greatest Baptist preacher outside of the Apostle Paul, right? Some of you will get that. You know, the Apostle Paul. Yeah, okay. uh, it's amazing to, to where he marks his conversion. He'd been struggling with conviction of sin, but he never found the answer. You know, in fact, everywhere that he would uh, go, every church that he would go, it was always this, do right, do right, do right, do right, do right, do right. And when he looked at his heart, all he saw was wrong, wrong, wrong. And he was set to meet up with a friend and go to a certain um, uh, church in London one night, and it was a massive snowstorm. And he stumbled in, and he did, didn't even know where he was in, in London because there was such a bad snowstorm. And that very night, he stumbled into a church, and there was a uh, layman that came into the pulpit to preach that night because the vicar of that church couldn't even make it to the church because of the snowstorm that happened to be right there. And he started preaching from Isaiah. You know, and he started preaching the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ. And as Spurgeon talks about it, you know, he murdered the king's English because this was an uneducated man. He said, but as he preached, light dawned on his soul. He finally saw that Christ was the answer, that Christ was the one who purchased his redemption. And he said he walked out of that church that night, a changed man, and he walked into a snowstorm, and guess what? He never found that church again. He never found that individual again. You know, and you can imagine that man preaching in the pulpit thinking nothing was done that night. You know, I gave it all my effort. And here it is. The greatest man, the greatest preacher, the most productive preacher, the most fruitful preacher as far as external fruit, you know, that, that night came to a saving knowledge of Christ. But you could even go back further. Because this man here, this simple man who murdered the king's English, somebody had to witness to him. Somebody had to testify to him. Somebody had to train him to preach the word of God. And guess what? This person over here, somebody had to train that person. You know, and there's probably a multitude of people that are putting their efforts into this person and putting them, and it goes back and back and back. And we never know, even the fruit in the future has saved the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How far that message when we preach it, how far that testimony, how far that help of one believer, and they'll help other believers, how far it goes out, how many generations it goes out. And here's my whole point. God's word never comes back void. You know, guess what? Here I am. I don't seem that, that talented. Guess what? For a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, 30, 60, hundred massive fruitfulness in your life and guess what we'll see in this life we'll just see a modicum of it but God will do so much encourage your heart encourage your heart with the goodness 
of God in your life. He's always doing far more. Be, be busy about the Lord's work. He's always doing far more for his glory and the good of his people. Praise God. Let's bow our hearts a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your glory. We thank you with your patience for us, Lord. We thank you even when times that were so discouraged, the times where, Lord, we even feel like, feel like throwing in the towel, that even the Lord questioning, why should I go on? Is it worth it? All of this rejection, all of this hatred many times, all of this scorn and ridicule. And Lord, as we come to your word, even as we've gone through these three chapters and see the greatest light that has ever existed, Jesus Christ, and see the scorn and ridicule that came in his life, Lord, we realize that he played for an audience of one. Lord, that he came to do your will and your will alone. But Lord, in the midst of all that preaching, in the midst of all that work that was done, we realize that you were working in hearts and lives. And God, we, re we remember this obscure preacher that time has forgotten. And that happens to be John the Baptist. And his faithfulness, Lord, in the discharge, in the ministry that you've given him, the simple message that you had given him. Lord, in the fruit that he never saw in his lifetime. Lord, he never saw these throngs. He never saw these many come to Jesus and recognize Jesus because of his ministry. Lord, may our hearts be encouraged that the lessons we teach in Vacation Bible School, the lessons we teach in Junior Church, the lessons we teach maybe on a Wednesday night, Lord, the interactions that we have with other people, the discussions we have about the Lord Jesus Christ are doing far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think. And may we give you all the glory to your name, Lord, as we trust in you. We thank you so much. Just be with us as we're dismissed now. In Jesus' name, amen.